Well, good morning, everybody. Was that too loud? Too loud? Thank you very much for telling me. I really appreciate it. It's been a really exciting conference, uh, my colleagues, and I've got uh, Joel Bloomfield here. Put your hand up, Joel. Joel's an account manager for Microsoft. So if you want to have a talk about all these things, any questions at all, redirect them to Joel. He's going to... Isn't that right, Joel? Thank you. Uh, so I'm Mark McManus. I'm the cloud lead in the education team in Microsoft. Been working with Microsoft for five years. Thank you for those of you who've come to speak to us at the stand. Uh, those of you who had to go at the HoloLens as well. I uh, hope you enjoyed having a go at that. We've got some pictures later on. Some thumbs up there in the, in the audience. Thank you. But so what we thought we'd uh, talk about is the impact, the impact of cloud services within your institutions. Uh, and it's been quite an impact. It's, it's been quite a journey for us. Uh, Microsoft's on a transformation journey in terms of transforming our business, the way we, we, we work with the good selves. Uh, and hopefully you've seen a more open uh, Microsoft who wants to talk to you, wants to understand how we can do things better uh, and how we can interact better. So uh, this, I'm showing this because uh, I'm obliged to. Uh, this is Microsoft's mission and where we are um, in terms of our future and strategy. As you may know, we have a new CEO who's been in, in post now for uh, just over three years, Satya Nadella, and his vision is, is somewhat different. Uh, it's more interactive. He has a real key focus on education. He understands the value of education, and that's really good. That's good for us, good for you. And it's interesting that these values, the mission, the strategy, etc., are resonate with senior leadership teams in universities and colleges, uh, councils that we talk to around education. Uh, because education is on transition. Um, it's interestingly, we, we very recently have been approached by groups of commercial organizations who want to set up their own academic institutions. Now, we talk about competition in the sector. Um, so, we're working with a, a group in the Isle of Man currently where they want to uh, create their own uh, university. Um, Alman obviously gets certain tax benefits, um, lots of organizations there, commercial organizations, but they can't get enough IT staff. They can't get enough people. So even when the economy is low or anything like that, they and others, ourselves included, cannot get enough IT people. Programmers, people using Microsoft stuff, can't get enough of them. And so what they've done, they've grouped together and they've made it a commercial university uh, where students are working on premises three days a week with the commercial site, so as soon as they get their computer degree, they can walk straight into a job. Now, that's interesting. That's an interesting angle in terms of competition, as well as global competition from other universities, from other organizations. Uh, we're seeing changes in the way education is delivered. Uh, in the way. I don't know if you read the article in California. There's a, a new university that has no lecturers. The students teach each other peer-to-peer -peer training and education. Again, kind of out there, but where does that lead? What's, you know, there's a lot of interest around that and how that goes. So lots of things happening. So these kind of resonate with senior leadership teams uh, within the organizations, academic organizations that we're working with. How do we transition? How do we adapt to this new world uh, that we're living in? So we talk about digital transformation and what does that mean? Well, in terms of uh, your organizations, you know, it's engaging with the students. Students are coming in now how many devices do they have each? How many devices? I asked a question to a group of students not so long ago, uh, and I start with how many has one device, and they put, everybody puts their hand up. Two devices, still everybody's got their hand up. Three devices, still everybody's got their hand up. Four devices, a few hands go down. Five, six, I was up to 11 devices, and still those two or three students had their hands up. And that's kind of interesting. I go around with universities, they dread January. The start of the new term after Christmas, everybody's got their new wireless devices. The wireless has go down because there's just too many devices. Uh, and so that's kind of interesting. How do we adapt to that? Um, how do we transform the services to, to adapt to that new demand? Demand from our staff, our students, our senior leadership teams. Optimizing operations, we're always, try, always trying to do that. Reducing costs, reducing complexity. One of my favorite sayings is... Um, Complexity, I've forgotten the saying. <laughs> One of my favorite sayings. Innovation stifles complexity. No, the other way around. Complexity stifles innovation. Complexity stifles innovation. 
So too much complexity, it stifles innovation. And you're all about, what are you about as organizations? You're about teaching and learning, innovation and creativity. Uh, and if IT is getting a little bit hard, then, then that's kind of not the right way. IT should be an enabler. You, you talked in the previous session about the tools and the, and the service you can use for project management and project processes, etc. Uh, they're tools and they should be there to enable what you do, to help you what you do, to remove complexity. If IT is becoming a stumbling block, then there's something wrong. There's something wrong. And so we're all about trying to improve the IT services that you use. Uh, to increase productivity, to enhance what you do, to enhance teaching and learning, to enhance creativity and innovation. That's what we're all about. The good old days. Remember the good old days? When the only IT staff and students had was what you controlled within your own organizations. So it was your machines, it was your servers, there was no going out to the internet or anything like that, there was no mobile devices. It was easy to control. It was centralized, it was easy to manage, more secure, arguably, it's just a lot easier. Those days are long gone, long gone. If staff or students can't access the services they want, if they can't do what they want to do, they'll bypass IT and they'll start using consumer-based services, which is great. And, and we saw a, a, an example of a few of those tools in the previous session. Go out and there's some really great tools out there. But what's the challenge with some of those tools? Oh, that's a question, by the way. Uh, what's the challenge with some of those tools? What's the challenge if I go out and start using, say, Twitter or Facebook and stuff for business processes, for business services, using business data, personal information? There's a hint in there somewhere. Information security. We get the chief security officers in universities sweating because the staff and students are using services outside of the security realm. Where is that personal information being stored? And where is that secure information? Where is my IP going? Uh, if staff and students are beginning to use consumer-based services, the bypassing IT to do so. So how can we address that? How can we make sure that staff and students are getting the same experience that they should get with consumer-based services within the confines and the security uh, of the university? or the academic sites that we're working with. Collaboration and openness on one hand, security, privacy, data protection, seemingly on the other. How do we control those two areas? There's a, there's a balance to be struck there. Uh, and that always, always uh, addresses productivity. So that's just a, a quick, uh, quick thing in terms of cloud momentum. Uh, a little bit of bias from Microsoft. This is Microsoft's bias here. 86% um, of all academic institutions, schools, colleges, universities in the country are using some sort of Microsoft Cloud service. Uh, probably more if we added consumer, but this is again talking about services that you manage, that you control, security wrap around it, compliant data protection, etc. Um, we have 112 universities using Office 365. Uh, by the end of this academic year, that will be 125 plus. Uh, how many using Office 365? Whoa, wow, gosh, that's good. That's, that was, I'm not even going to count. Uh, a few years ago, when I, was, I could count the, the number of hands, and, and, and it, was, it rose from 20, 30, 40, 50%. Uh, that was 80% percent plus, put your hands up. Uh, now, that's interesting. Now, okay, so a lot of our academic organizations are using it for email, a little bit of storage. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the impact on productivity, how we can improve productivity by using some of these tools, the toolkits, right? They're there for you to use, but again, within the confines of security wrap around your university. Uh, things like 365 and other cloud services, they're managed by your IT team, they're controlled by your IT team. Uh, there's compliance, you know, we have to comply uh, to data protection, privacy laws, UK, European, worldwide. Um, if you've ever seen a picture of one of our data centers, um, one, of, one of the versions, we have different versions of data centers, uh, one of the versions is literally full of containers. Think Eddie Stobart containers. And those containers are full of computers and networking kit and all sorts of amazing and wonderful technologies. Um, and there's huge amounts of them within a given single building. Our data centers are made up of multiple buildings, uh, and each building is uh, larger than three football pitches uh, and full of those containers in that particular version. Uh, there isn't a container in the corner that's rusting and falling apart for the academic community. 
your services are mixed in working with commercial organizations, central government, pharmaceutical, health, uh, medical, NHS, etc. And you benefit from the levels of compliance that we have to adhere to um, to ensure that those customers use our stuff. Uh, so those levels of compliance are typically far higher than any university would have to adhere to depending on uh, the data that you're working with. So that, that's good, that's good, right? So, you know, you, you benefit from all of that. Uh, so, as I say, we've got this huge memory, over 12 million. That's academic accounts in the country. Students, staff, um, lecturers, researchers, etc., using our stuff uh, in terms of Office 365 uh, around the country. So think of that collaboration, that potential for innovation uh, and creativity is really important. So hopefully uh, you've seen this kind of... Uh, this is the waffle. Have you, anybody heard it called that before? The Americans call it the waffle because it looks like a waffle. It's little squares. And each little square represents the services, the toolkits that you can use within your 365 environment. Is everybody familiar with that? Yeah, that's good. Lots of nods. I, I, that's my job done, I think. There you go. So, um, so, lots and lots of services. I'm not going to teach you how to use... Uh, email, so hopefully you know how to, be, how to use email and calendaring, etc. But, but some of the services in there perhaps not being used or perhaps haven't been enabled yet. Uh, some of them to help you with that productivity, uh, to help you with... Uh, this. So, for, for, for exa example, um, you're talking about toolkits for process management, project management, etc. Uh, one of the services that we have in here uh, is Project Online. Anybody hear of Project Online? Project online. So again, this is a this is a centralised approach to managing process and project management. We have several universities using this for uh, project portfolio management. Uh, one because it's free, <laughs> so which is nice. It's a nice toolkit. Again, the security wrap around it. Uh, it's not a consumer outside product. It's based on your 365 environment. Um, who of you are program managers, project managers, etc. Yeah, a few hands. Uh, and you're the ones that everybody comes to in terms of, right, the assignments, the tasks. I've done this, and what do you have to do? You have to key it in. Is that right? Do you have to key that into the main project? Whatever tool you're using, you have to key that in. Uh, the idea of project online is that you don't have to do that. You set a task, you assign it to somebody or a group of people, that task goes out into their calendar, into their appointments, whatever it may be. They pick up on that task, they reply to that either in email or in their browser or in any device anywhere. That gets sent back to the central machine and updates your project on your machine. You don't have to do that keying in anymore. And people who are replying on the assignments don't have to understand project or project tools to do it. It's a simple reply to a task. I've done that. Here's the time I did it. Here's the report behind it. Sounds good? Sounds good? Yeah. Yes, that sounds really good. So, so uh, and based on that as well, we, we can also store project documents. So if you've got Word documents or PDF documents, it doesn't have to be Microsoft documents associated with that project, then they can all be stored in the same place that everybody can see. This whole concept of working with singular documents, share a link to a document. That may seem like a very simple thing. It's been around a long time since uh, 365 was introduced to the community over four years ago now. Um, but still we get people who send emails with a document attached to it. I'm not going to ask, I'm not going to ask, put your hands up or anything like that. But we all do it. Send the document out. I've got 10 people in the group that I'm sending it to. All of a sudden I've got 11 copies of the document. And then they all add their bits to the document. And then I've got to collate all of that. And all of a sudden, I've got documents out of sync, and that doesn't really work. Uh, I was up in St. Andrews University this week on Monday and talking to one of their program managers, and they were saying, yeah, we had, we had that. And that we had a big event on, uh, and the, the document behind it, a bit of a project document behind it, and all the steps, etc. everybody. But he sent the document out uh, to the other people in, who was helping him with the, the assignment, uh, and all of a sudden, he got the wrong versions and the people who were setting up the place got the wrong version of the document and they set it up. The whole thing was a failure. The whole event was a failure because they got the wrong version of a document. A simple thing like that. The wrong version of a document and the whole thing collapsed. Uh, to me, that was kind of gold dust because that's, it helps me promote this idea of sharing a link. Share a link to a document. If you're sharing a document that you want input on from other people, share the link to the document. 
Everybody can then contribute to that document in real time. Up to 200 people. Well, probably you wouldn't want that many people, maybe. But there's up to 200 people can share that document in real time. You all work on the same document at the same time. Putting in tenders or calls for rest requests for calls, responses for research programs, etc. You can all work on the same document at the same time. Automatically underneath, version control is taking place. So you can go back if there's an issue. Send out a link to the document. Get that. Don't use email as your storage area. Uh, those days, hopefully, we can move away from. Just that simple thing in terms of productivity and impact has had a massive change in lots of organizations that I'm working with. Just that simple contact, uh, concept of sharing an environment, a project group, with everybody in the team and then sharing those documents and sharing links to the documents. Any changes to the documents, everybody gets a notification that there's been a change in the document. Just helps so much in terms of reducing time, productivity, etc. That makes sense? People doing that already? Some people are doing that already. It's a good practice. That's fantastic. Thank you for that, yes. <laughs> well, we noticed there was a little bit of a, a bias on the Google sites for, from the previous presentation. So, so... Um, so, digital storytelling. One of the uh, services, where I was again, I was up in St. Andrews University uh, yesterday, uh, on Monday rather, and they, uh, one of the challenges they had was getting information out to the campus and staff, uh, information, etc. Uh, and, and what formats and how do you do that? And you know, browser-based is, is idea, across devices, uh, iPads, even Androids, uh, devices, uh, Macs, PCs, etc., etc., uh, I can make information available. And that seems to be one of the best formats because everybody's mobile, everybody's got these multiple devices that they're using. You want to look at stuff cross-device and you want to get the same experience regardless of the device or the service they're running. Uh, and so we, we introduced something called Sway, digital storytelling. And so basically it's an editor. It looks a little bit like words in terms of uh, look and feel, so uh, uh, most people are familiar with that kind of format. Uh, but it's an easy way to create a browser-based document without having to understand HTML, CS5, or whatever. Uh, so we've got students across the country using this for digital portfolio management. So a portfolio of their lifetime in the university, and then they share that then with potential employers, share that with staff members, etc. Uh, St. Andrews University using it for newsletters. Very easy way to create a newsletter, make it available to the whole campus, to groups of people, to individuals, whatsoever. Very easy and efficient way to do that. Again, Sway is, a, is the service that we use to do that within the Office 365 suite. Anybody using Sway? So a few people. So yeah, have a look at that because that's really good in terms of, the, of, of, of getting information, your digital story out there. And we've got some universities using that for training purposes, uh, information purposes. It's kind of more interactive. Because it's browser-based, we can do some clever things. Uh, we can have inter interactions between the individual reading it uh, we can have videos embedded, etc. Uh, pictures flipping around. Et it makes it more interesting. It's more interactive than reading a standard PDF or Word document or whatever. So again, have a look at that in terms of productivity, getting information out there. Uh, sharing and finding information. So, um, so I, again, uh, previous session, excellent, really good session, by the way. I really enjoyed it. Um, but again, some of the tools, understandably, consumer-based, go out there, Facebook, Twitter, etc., etc. And that's fine, that's okay for general information. In terms of data protection and privacy security, uh, again, we, we, take, we typically have the uh, security officers weeping over those types of things. Um, so again, within the confines of 365, we have a, a, a Twitter, Facebook type service um, uh, called Yammer. Anybody using Yammer? Yeah, excellent, okay, so good, excellent. I was talking to John, uh, John there from, from Highlands and Islands. Uh, campus spread all over the place. Uh, in terms of, 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 of uh, and, and trying to communicate and, uh, and, and get the right information at the right time it was a challenge in the past, John. Is that right? Yes. So, so John enabled Yammer. Now, Yammer is really interesting. It breaks down political barriers. Now, as Mark McManus in the cloud education team of Microsoft, I typically wouldn't contact Satya Nadella directly via an email and say, Satya, listen, this strategy you're doing, don't really understand it. Can you explain it to me? He's not going to reply, and I'll probably get a P45 uh, in a few days. Um, so, but Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, belongs to groups in Yammer. 
and will reply to those groups. So a question you go out, there are subject matter groups, there's a general group, you can ask questions. We get questions, as Microsoft people, answered quicker using Yammer than we do email. And you get to the source of the truth quicker because if somebody makes a comment and it's not quite wise, you can guarantee somebody will make a, co a counter comment to say, actually, this is where that information is or actually, this is the truth. And you get to the truth quicker. It breaks down political barriers. And you get to the source of truth really, really quickly. If it's used efficiently in the process. And John, great example of, uh, uh, of using that across disparate... Um, sites and centres uh, across the, the northern Scotland Islands there. So a really good example then, I'm sure you've all, all of you have got uh, examples of that. But again, within the confines, it's not public access. It's got a security wrap around it, it's compliant. So again, this balance between collaboration, openness, and security and data protection. So we don't have our CSOs, our chief security officers, weeping uh, her every day as to how they're going to protect their data, etc. So again, have a look at that. If you hadn't a look at it, it's really powerful. Now, we talk about these services individually. The real benefit of these services is the fact that they're integrated. This is a platform. And often, uh, and I shouldn't really say this, but often I think Office 365 is named wrong. I know, shock horror. Uh, because when you think of Microsoft and Office, what do you think of? What comes to mind? Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Yes, and they're all there. They're all in 365. Well, they're just part of it. This is a platform for collaboration, real-time communication, and productivity. And they're integrated. So we talked about Skype before in the previous session. The benefits are having Skype sessions. And again, that's all free. That's we, we offer that to the community. Now you can set up a Skype session really easily, bring in other people dynamically, and have that video link, audio link, Share a whiteboard. Anybody share the whiteboard? So we're doing some work with JISC um, on a, a new connection to the Janet network and uh, with, with uh, Staffordshire University and we had four key stakeholders from around the world all communicating. We were trying to map out this network that we were trying to build because we had the new connection from Microsoft to Janet. We had the Janet connection from Janet to staff. So we had the staffs in turn. We were trying to map this out. It was quite complex. Whiteboard session. And we all did it. Across the world, we, had, we were all interacting at the same time, uh, creating this whiteboard. We saved that, made it formal, really easy, dynamic to do. And that's fantastic. And again, as an independent service, Skype is fantastic. Hopefully, you enjoy that. And Skype for business, again, within the confines of your security realms. It's not a consumer service. There's, there's auditing taking place. You can track things. Um, we, sometimes, culturally, we have some interesting conversations about students having access to staff in terms of Skype for business. Anybody done that? We have several universities that have done that, where the students are saying, well, actually, I want more. I want more connection with the, 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 the lecturers. I want to have access to it. I don't want to have to go to the office and queue up. Wouldn't it would be great if I could dynamically access them from the library and we could bring in other people? And so we do have some universities where the staff members have done that. They make themselves available via Skype to the students. And they're having these more dynamic sessions, uh, pulling other people in, other students, the staff members. Again, that innovation and creativity, mixing it a little bit. Um, and, and Skype has been transformational in terms of addressing that student experience about having student-to-staff connection. But again, at the background, it's audited, we can track conversations, etc. That's important. But the point is, is that all these services are integrated. So, so I can run a Skype call from within Yammer. If I'm in my calendar, I can find out if somebody's immediately available. So rather than book an appointment with them, actually they're right there, the green little dot next to that individual's name. And that little green dot can be red if they're busy, red with a white line through, do not disturb, I'm presenting. In fact, you can have your own markers. We had a, a council in, uh, in Derby for their schools uh, decide that they'll have their own markers in there. Uh, and they had a little bit, um, uh, a little bit um, shall we say, the teachers were doing stuff uh, outside of their normal hours of work. Uh, so it's a little bit controversial in that respect. However, they were offering help for homework. And the students would flag themselves of needing some help. So I need help. 
was one of their options in the drop-down box. And that would immediately flag the teacher, and the teacher would come online between the hours of 6 and 6.30 and help the student individually with their homework. So that's kind of interesting. That's kind of interesting. Um, how many of you in email, you get into an email discussion? You send out any question, you get a reply, you, get, you want to feedback, and you get, you're almost waiting for the reply. Um, when I go to send an email, if I see that little dot is green to the individual or individuals I'm sending it to, hey, why send an email? I can go through instant, instant, instant messaging, audio, set up a video conference. We're getting to the root of the question quicker. It's all about improving productivity. So these systems are integrated. So we've got this Yammer type uh, interface integrated with our Skype system, which is integrated with our calendaring, which is integrated with our email, which is integrated with the authors of each document so I can contact them directly. It's all pre-integrated for you. That's powerful. That's really powerful. Uh, feedback and service. Again, it was in St. Andrews, we did a workshop on how we can use all this stuff in a teaching and learning and staff uh, environments. And I said, well, what's an example? What's a really good example right now that you're worried about? And the leader of the team said, I've got to sort out the Christmas party. <laughs> so we actually used that as an example during the workshop. How we set up all the tasks, I signed them all out, and one of them was the Christmas menu. They almost cried, oh, the times I've had in terms of trying to get feedback from people in terms of the Christmas menu. So we used that as an example. So, uh, again, one of the facilities in, in, in Microsoft Office 365 is this forms facility. You can create a form really quickly, multi-choice, multi tick box, feedback, etc., etc. Um, send it out to individuals, to groups, to the whole campus if you wanted to. Get that feedback and then you get these nice uh, pie charts and all sorts of graphs as to who's which starters people have chosen, who's responded um, down to the individual level. So that's, that's really powerful. I can get, send out a survey to all students if I wanted to, and I'll find out the percentage of students who've responded, uh, I'll find out what they responded, etc. really, really quickly, dynamically, real time. I can export that to spreadsheets if I wanted to, if I wanted to collect that information, or just leave it in the dashboard as it is. So again, very powerful little tool part of your 365 environment. It's already there. Just wanted to cover, we made some changes to the, the licensing side of things. Uh, if you remember, we have the free version. So you get your, your email uh, with your unlimited archiving built into that. And you've got your storage space, unlimited storage space, etc., etc. And then we had some chargeable options, which are more to do with security. So the ability to encrypt email, the ability to... Uh, and enable data loss prevention. So it was all around some more security stuff, and especially when we were moving staff uh, to the cloud. So what we did, we merged all of that into one uh, offering for academia. So you've got all those controls now built into Office 365, so those enhancements in terms of security, data loss prevention, encryption of email, rights management. I can encrypt a single file. If I've created a PowerPoint, I can say, well, actually, I only want my team to see that PowerPoint. And if that PowerPoint presentation does happen to get emailed to somebody outside of that group, it doesn't matter if it ends up on their own personal device, on their own home computer. If they try and open it, they won't be able to. They'll be prompted to log into 365. If they haven't got the rights in 365, they won't be able to open that individual document. Rights management, really important in terms of IP for research if you're dealing with uh, sensitive information, etc. Again, that balance between collaboration, data protection and privacy trying to get that balance right between the two. That makes sense? No more details about that, but again, making more and more uh, offering to the academic community uh, in terms of those enhanced security, uh, as well as enhancements to the collaboration environment. All right, so that's Office 365. Now we're talking about Microsoft Azure. Microsoft Azure is our platform for building stuff. Uh, for, for looking at your data centers. We have lots of universities where, working with one university where they literally can't get any more power into their data center physically. They can't get any more power. They don't have to build another data center. So what are the options there? We have, we've had some universities where, and I, I won't mention names for obvious reasons, where the audit regarding failure, they, they, they had a, uh, a disaster in the data center and the failover didn't work properly, disaster recovery, didn't really work properly. So they had uh, a massive audit. The auditor said, you need a secondary service. You've got to have a secondary service for the sake of your business. 
Because if these services go down, then financially you're at risk as an organization. And so their option was, we build another two data centers. Now that's an easy sentence to say. There's several million pounds worth of investment and about a year's time uh, to do that. So, using cloud services, uh, this particular university I'm thinking of, they didn't do that. They put it in the cloud. Because if you think about cloud, you only pay for what you use. It's utility. It's like electricity or water. You only pay for what you use. So in terms of, of disaster recovery, think about that. You, you only pay when, it, when there's a disaster or when you're testing the service. So in terms of the costs, the equivalent costs in terms of building a new data center and running those services in the cloud, a fraction of the cost. A fraction of the cost. So that helped them really quickly. And in terms of setting that up, several months compared to a full year. So again, faster in terms of recovery and, and addressing the business requirement. So that's really important. So cloud gives us that. Uh, uh, so in terms of our cloud services, we've got 34 regions. You can use this. We've got lots of universities with sites around the world. You can use our network between our data systems, our data centers rather, to communicate and transfer data for, as part of that service. So if there are um, sites in China, the sites in, 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 in India or America or whatever, we can transfer and, and we can share information. Uh, we've just announced three new data centers in the UK. They're up and running now. So again, that commitment to the UK. That wasn't anything to do with Brexit, by the way. That was just because of business demand. There's nothing to do with trying to preempt Brexit or anything like that. This is, it gives you a, a snapshot of what Azure is. Uh, don't be too worried about the complexity of that. Uh, we've got all the basic infrastructure services, so compute power, We've got storage, we've got networking, etc. But the really interesting bits are up here. Analytics, predictive analytics, um, in, uh, artificial intelligence, services that are pre-built, ready to go. Services that if you tried to build them yourselves, it would take you at least three to six months, depending on the service, and would cost you a lot of money in terms of infrastructure. They're ready to go now, and you could use them for a few minutes if you wanted to. An hour, a, a day, a few months, and drop them again. Think of that in terms of research. We were working with a, a university in the Northeast, and the, um, we, were, we were demonstrating our words to a, a researcher. Um, and he said, well, I'm, I'm setting up a, a data analytics service, so big data crunching, uh, and it's based on a, a service called Hadoop. Anybody heard of Hadoop? Hadoop is an open source environment for big data. It's how we crunch lots and lots of data. And we've got a framework already built based on the open source environment. Not Microsoft uh, proprietary, it's based on open source. It's a big framework. It's already there, ready to go. <coughs> the researcher we were working with took him three months to get the procurement, plus two months, so five months so far, uh, to build the environment. The researcher wants to get on with his research, really. He didn't really want to do all of that. Uh, but the IT services said they couldn't do it. So that's one thing to be interested in. IT services said, no, we can't do that. So they, the researcher had to go to the department, uh, ask for some cash, order that stuff, build it, and then they were ready to do their research. Five months. Our demonstration guy did the same thing, exactly the same thing in terms of the compute spec, etc., uh, in less than an hour using cloud. Uh, the researcher nearly cried because <laughs> all that time I've spent, five months, trying to get that up and running. And I could have been focused on what I really want to do, which is the research and the analysis of the data. Quicker to the research. Um, and that's really, really interesting. You think about some of the great innovations of our time as humans. Um, they all need <coughs> connecting bits. You think about, you're sitting in this room, you're sitting on chairs and a carpet and there's all the electronics. How many innovations and inventions have brought you here? Thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Um, and they all take a lot of time. You think of Leonardo da Vinci. He pictured a helicopter. Have you, everybody seen that picture of Leonardo da Vinci's helicopter? He pictured it. He envisioned it. Even down to some of the engineering parts. But the engineering of the time simply couldn't match his vision. They couldn't 
deliver it. Charles Babbage, his analytics machine. Anybody heard of Charles Babbage? Please say you've heard. Thank you. <coughs> Founder of the way computers work. Uh, came up with an, a, a differential machine, which he actually got up and running. Had to build it from scratch and get funds to build it from scratch. Uh, and then had the idea of an analytics machine, a machine you could program. And Ada Lovelace arguably wrote the first computer program, which never ran because he never finished his analytics machine. Because he was building it from scratch, he never realized his vision. The innovation around it wasn't there. So what's the relevance to that? In terms of researchers having access to stuff like this, how quickly can they get access? How quickly can they start their research and get down uh, to sorting out the problems that we have uh, in this world. And that sounds kind of grandiose, but it's true. We've got researchers now using this stuff to help with cancer research uh, and processing genomics, uh, to help with the flows of rivers. Uh, so we, we, we worked with a, a university in this country to help with flood plains and uh, uh, predicting uh, floods and, and flood disasters. Um, having access to this, means you focus on the innovation and the creativity, not the fact that I have to build it from scratch. And that's the key. Surely as organizations, um, you're about creativity, you're about innovation, you're about teaching and learning. Not about IT, really. You're not IT companies, you're innovative, you're creative, you're teaching and learning. Uh, it's not about the IT. We'll do the boring stuff. We'll make sure the platform's there. And whenever the new ideas come out, we'll make them available and we'll put them in frameworks so you can use them right away. Researchers can have these at their fingertips today. And there's some really exciting projects going on. Have a look at Microsoft Research uh, and the stuff we're doing, some of the universities in this country. Really, really exciting uh, in terms of that potential. So just a few examples of that. Uh, so, so first of all, we talked about compliance, levels of compliance, huge, massive We've got thousands of people on compliance and security around the world. Uh, usually when people ask me, what about security, Microsoft? We're putting all your stuff, all our stuff on your data centers. Uh, and I usually ask the question back, well, how many people in your organization are dedicated full-time job to security and compliance? How many? Maximum I got two is three. That was a large university. Three people dedicated. Four. This, I've got one more now. I'll speak to you later. Thank you. Dedicated to compliance and security. Four, we literally have thousands of people around the world. We can't afford a data breach in one of these. Physical security, we have tank pits around the data centers to stop them being ram raided. The physical and virtual security on these systems is huge, it's massive. It's far beyond any university would really want to invest in terms of that level of security and compliance, data protection, etc. Um, Open source. So a lot of people, you know, traditionally uh, think Microsoft, think, well, it's Microsoft proprietary stuff. Satya Nadella, Nadella's revolution is it's all about openness. Um, we signed a deal with Red Hat earlier this year. Let me just let you sink that in a bit. Hell froze over. <laughs> you think about, you know, the, 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 you know, the angst that from Microsoft to the open source community, embracing the open source community. Uh, we get more... We get, more, um, uh, we get more pats on the back in Microsoft if we're putting open source stuff on Azure than we do with our own stuff. And I'll, I'll share with you one example. But again, open source, massive. A lot of the big, the big stuff, the big data analytics and the predictive analytics is based on open source technologies. And we're working and contributing back to the open source technology. So let me give you some examples. Birmingham City University. These are quotes directly from the university. And again, they're one of these universities where they want to say yes to the researchers. They want to say yes to their academic groups. Instead of saying, well, no, we can't really do that right now. It's going to take four months to procure. Maybe it's going to take them a few months to build. They want to say yes now, and they've got that. They've adopted Azure specifically for that. So they can say yes to the community. Yes, we can do that. You want ter 10 terabytes of data storage? Yes, I can have that for you this afternoon. If you want uh, a thousand node cluster, yes, I'll have that for you this afternoon. So they say yes to the community, set it up quicker to research. And you can see some of the comments here. This one's really important. Uh, some of the uh, uh, universities that are looking to really grow their research. Uh, a lot of the grants, the calls for um, 
feedback and, and, and requests for grants, uh, they're asking for ISO 27001 accreditation in your own organizations. Uh, and some of them now are asking seven, uh, ISO 27018, data protection and privacy. That costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time to get that kind of accreditation. Uh, our data centers have them already. So by using our data centers, they're saying they're compliant uh, and when they're applying for grants for research projects. So that's an interesting point in terms of business impact. Yeah, the finances around that. Uh, so that's extending on-premise information data centers because we're all about hybrid. Microsoft's about hybrid. We have millions of customers using our stuff on-premise around the world. We would be fools to say we've now just got a cloud strategy. So we've invested a huge amount of money in hybrid and making sure this stuff works is what you've got on-premise and you use cloud as and when it's most appropriate, as and when it makes sense for you. At JISC, our friends at JISC, we've just, as I said, we've just set up a, a new enhanced higher speed connection um, with the Janet network as well as our, our, our twin peered connections that we have already. Uh, but JISC themselves are using Azure. They're using Azure for the UK Access Management Federation hub, which is literally used by most <coughs> colleges and universities in the country. Uh, that's running on Azure. It's running on Azure on Red Hat. There was lots of flags waved when that went in. It's on Red Hat. It's open source technologies. Uh, and again, reasons why they used it there, uh, which is fantastic. Northumbria University. Uh, really, really innovative. They come up with lots and lots of ideas. They see, again, they caught the vision of using Azure as a platform. Uh, quicker to fail. Now, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Quicker to fail. Research, you hit a lot of dead ends. And if you spent months and months and months and you've hit a dead end and you have to backtrack, yeah, that can be time wasted. Azure gives you quicker time to fail. Interesting. Without huge amounts of costs wrapped around it. Uh, and I can rebuild, learn what I've um, learned from that failure, move on, rebuild, scrap what I did really easily without having had that investment in capital, um, uh, the, the actual machines itself. So one more, I think, i just, just skip one a little bit. Sorry, no, that was the last one. So we've got other examples across the country. Uh, please speak to me about other examples. But, you know, it's an exciting time. It really is. We've got in all sorts of things going on. Rose-Rose was interesting, very quickly, um, they're using the Internet of Things. They've got uh, sensors in all their engines, 30-odd thousand of them around the world, feeding into Azure, real-time analytics about mean time to failure, efficiency, fuel efficiencies, etc. They're changing the service that they offer to the customers in terms of enhancing that. Um, just quickly, what's the next? Go beyond the screen. We had the HoloLens here. Yes, there's five in the country. Uh, we had a few people trying them out. Um, there's a case study on... Uh, HoloLens is mixed reality. So you still see the room that you're in. The HoloLens itself maps out the room and puts holographs on tables, on chairs, and you interact with the holographs as well as the real world. So it's not virtual reality where you're fully enhanced, uh, fully... Uh, in, uh, uh, in the moment, you don't see anything else. This is mixed reality. Uh, we had a few people using that yesterday. Um, on our, we had people looking at a skeleton floating around and brains, and opening up brains and looking inside of them while people were walking through them uh, getting their coffee, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, but again, linking that with cloud is the next step. Thank you. I hope that's been of use to you in terms of impact of cloud to your business and organizations, teaching and learning and innovation. Thank you very much.